we'll start the questions and answer session now. And uh, we have lots of questioners and only one answerer. <laughs> but he, he, he doesn't mind. So anyway, um, I see the mic raised at table 14. And I'll take a question from table 14 first. Um, I'm the facilitator at table 14. Uh, the citizens at this table have uh, three questions. Um, I'll ask two of them, and one of the citizens will ask one of them, and they have one observation um, at the beginning. And the observation is in reference to uh, considering Copenhagen's reasons for cycling, that eco-friendly was the least um, reason given, and that in terms of considering the issues that have maybe better presented or packaged as energy um, and what happens there rather than climate change. And that was just the observation. Is that fair enough? Um, in terms of the three questions, uh, question one, um, it was recently announced by the Scottish Government that they were setting up a state-owned non-profit energy company. Can you comment on this? And the second question is, in terms of energy security, what can Ireland do to ensure we have future control of, res of our resources? Community-owned projects are fine for small onshore wind, solar farms, but do you think the state should own all or the majority of large onshore or offshore projects to ensure future energy security? And we'll have a further question. Uh, thank you very much. The um, third question that we have, and thank you for your very informed presentation. Um, there was one thing we felt in common between your presentation and the previous presentation, and that was there was a consensus of political agreement uh, in common to both, and there was an engagement in the citizens or local community involvement in both. Um, the question that we would have, how did this political agreement, how is this leadership structured in Scotland? We know from Denmark that they, they have set up an entire energy agency at government level to coordinate all of the activities. These were all of the subsidies, the incentives, and the entire programs, both public and private investment, and they managed, led, and direct that process. Uh, just for information, we have a national uh, mitigation plan from 2017. And basically, that plan is the vision for Ireland as to how we are going to lower our carbon and to have this uh, environment by 2050 that we would desire to have in terms of emissions. We don't have a political structure in place. There is no strategic joint coordination board at government level. So my question is, um, what political structures did you put in place to lead and manage this program? Yes, yes Andy, start with the first question. It's okay. probably the easiest, I think, um, if you're prepared to answer it. So the, the National Energy Company, um, I, I was actually at a, a speaking at, a, at, a, at, the, at the SNP party conference when it was announced on an energy panel, and none of us had any idea that it was coming. So in that sense, we, we knew that they had talked about it, but, but nobody yet is particularly clear about which part of the market it is going to get engaged with because um, it has to be very careful of state aid rules um, and yeah. also that there are already social enterprises operating in that space. So there are lots of things that a, a national energy company could do um, and I think we're interest, interested to see the ideas as they come forward over the next few months mm -hmm. to see what it will be intended to do. And actually it may play into that conversation you had about um, things like the Danish Energy Agency and things like that, where actually that is, is also just used as a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a source of expertise and so on that other people can draw on. So there are things that a, a national energy company could do, um, but it has to be very careful operating in the market um, that it doesn't break state aid rules. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are the EU rules. Yes, the Which EU state aid rules. Which won't be troubling you for very long. <laughs> Possibly not. <laughs> Don't go there. Um, <laughs> On energy security, um, we've seen a big growth in local energy ownership. So we'd set this, this target of 500 megawatts. We've exceeded that. We've now resetting it at 1,000 megawatts of locally owned energy in Scotland. 
um, will be pretty close to that by 2020. So in that sense, we've got a lot of, lo lot of local ownership. Do I think a government should own all energy infrastructure? No, as long as you can get the market to work in your favour would be my take. But you've got to get the market to work. And we certainly have a market in, in Great Britain, which many people, inc including the most recent um, analysis done by a guy called Dieter Helm, which was published last week, which basically said the energy market is broken. Uh, we need to do something very different. So I think a lot of our energy systems have been built around structures that were right 20, 30, 40 years ago. They're not right for a modern world where you have local, uh, small-scale uh, energy generation, um, where you've got a lot more uh, digital infrastructure and so on. So a lot of the systems that have been set up are not fit for purpose going forward. But if you can make it fit for purpose, then I don't think you should necessarily have full government ownership um, to make the system work. In terms of political agreement, um, I, I mentioned to a couple of tables that one of the really big things that happened as the debates about climate change were happening about 10 years ago in Scotland was on the one hand you had a real bottom-up groundswell of groups uh, which came under the Stop Climate Chaos banner, but they included faith groups, they included trade unions, they included environmental, non-governmental organisations, pressure groups. We also, as, it was, as these debates were going on, had business coming in and saying, it's fine, go for the bigger target, be bold, be visionary. So you didn't have a sort of split between business and environmental NGOs. You actually had a, a group all saying to the politicians, it's okay to be bold, it's okay to be visionary. And I think that's what has set Scotland aside. I think we've seen it in Denmark, but it sets it aside from many other countries where you've tended to have much more of a split where you've tended to have this, this argument, it's either the environment you're trying to save or it's the economy. And I think what Scotland and Denmark would argue is that actually you, nowadays, given the, the costs of technologies, given the, the development of IT technologies, you can actually have both. And I think that's the big difference. Um, Within Scotland, what they did was they created a climate change team in the government. It's now part of the Energy and Climate Change Department. Uh, there was also a climate change delivery board, which was a cross-government board set up of senior, uh, basically the directors and the director generals of different sectors, from agriculture to transport, who sat on that board. And then I was one of the non-government, non there were three external members of which I was one, to come and really challenge the, the government on what they were doing. But that was the cross-sector board that really was tasked with how do we deliver this across different sectors rather than it being siloed. Very good. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, what, what, table 8. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sean McCarthy from Table 8. And I have a kind of a comment and kind of followed on by a question. Um, the title of the topic that we have been considering over the last weekend and today is how the state can make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change. I think maybe there is a, we can tweak that a little bit and to say how the state can make Ireland a follower in tackling climate change. Because it seems to me that for leadership and in all leadership, great leaders and great leadership are those who can encourage people to come after them and to take up the baton and to break down the barriers. And it appears to me that I can go up to Ballycastle in County Antrim and I can look across 12 miles over to the Mullock Tyre. And from what we're hearing from Scotland is that they seem to be certainly a global leader along with, with, with uh, Denmark and Copenhagen. And if we have two uh, European countries that are taking the lead in that, I'm just wondering is there merit in us taking an approach where we would become followers and we would learn from there? And I suppose my question would be to Andy, um, like could he, would, would he think that there is merit in Ireland trying to join in some way with Scotland and with Denmark in learning from them um, and have cross-cultural and cross-country uh, partnerships at a political level, at an academic level, at a research level, so that we can learn what ye have done um, and to follow what ye have done rather than us trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so rather than being a leader, because we can't have all be leaders, become a follower of those who really have done this stuff really, really well. So is there merit in taking that approach, Andy? My experience, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to work in, in a number of different countries in this space over, over the last 10, 15 years, 
is that nobody has all of the answers. So I would strongly say it's not about just follower and leader, it's actually about sharing what works in different places. Um, you know, we, are, we have done very well on renewable electricity, on community engagement. Actually, we've done very badly on transport and can learn lots from Copenhagen on that. We've done, you know, poorly on agriculture. We can learn from other countries on that. So I, I do think it's not so much, you know, there's a shining beacon and everyone follows. It is much more how do we share good practice in different places. In terms of uh, should we be getting links, absolutely. So one of the, the things that I'm involved in um, is, uh, so I run an innovation center developing new business ideas. We're one of the clusters of a big European partnership called Climate Kick. The four clusters in the UK and Ireland are London, Birmingham, Edinburgh, and Dublin. Dublin are leading on the green finance side. So we're trying to work with Dublin on what Ireland are doing on green finance, on financial institutions, and so on, because we can learn from that, because we've also got a big finance industry which has not been at the forefront of some of this. So again, this whole notion of how do you share some really good ideas that are happening uh, how do you build those sort of partnerships is, is a really good one. But it's not a, it's not a sort of one, one leader and lots of followers. I think it is a two-way flow in different sectors that different people are doing well in. Cool. Uh, table seven. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a question from table seven. Um, you mentioned that um, you, you were struggling to persuade farmers um, to, to go along with all of this uh, despite various economic benefits. We were just wondering what form those economic benefits took? So, uh, I mean, the majority of farmers in Scotland rely on subsidy to keep going. Um, and, and so leaving everything else aside, you know, what Brexit will do is, is give a, it's gonna be a massive shock to the system anyway, regardless of anything else that happens. What, what Scotland has been trying to do, and it has, different schemes, and one of the schemes is called Farming for a Better Climate, is to use particular farms to test new things, which might be around precision farming, it might be around you know, reduced use of, uh, of fertiliser, or ways of improving livestock health and therefore productivity and so on. Um, and then using those as exemplars that other farmers then follow. And so there are some good examples of if you do certain things, the farm as a whole will save money and still deliver its outputs. So therefore, there is an economic benefit. What we found quite hard is to scale that. So you can say that particular farm or those farms doing those activities are better off because of it. But what we're not then seeing is that being spread across the whole sector. And so it's that, and that's partly just cultural. You know, I've been doing it this way for many years. I'm not gonna change now. Um, and, and so there aren't any easy answers around that. Um, and, and this is one of the challenges we have. Um, so one of the issues then is do you actually then try and force people? Do you say, rather than doing voluntary soil testing for, for um, you know, you actually have to make it mandated, rather than doing certain voluntary things with livestock, you've got to mandate <coughs> it. And that's the debate that's going on in Scotland at the moment. Yeah. Um, which table? Yeah. 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 Thank you, George. I am the facilitator for tur uh, table 13. I make these views on behalf of some of the members of the table. And um, the first two points are actually for the Secretariat. Uh, the members would like to know, did the Secretary invite a representative from the Department of uh, Transport to articulate the leadership issue and to take ownership? And, and if not, they, they would like to know why. Uh, and secondly, there is a suggestion that wants to be made from the members uh, and a possible recommendation for the ballot paper. And that there seems to be a number of different departments doing similar jobs and there's a need for consolidation and one department or group to take leadership uh, to show a unified political approach. Uh, and further suggestion is that there should be uh, one department with a programme uh, delivery office. And the members wanted to feed this um, right. back to yourselves. Right. I do have a question for Andrew. Well, it doesn't that, that doesn't arise out of the uh, roundtable discussion what the roundtable discussion was about. So I just want to, don't, don't want to waste oh, no, I do have a, I do have a question. So just put your question. Uh, what, um, can you explain uh, what is uh, green finance? <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of, when, when you're trying to develop new, say energy, low carbon energy projects, so renewable energy, clean energy projects, um, you need money to do it. You need money investors to invest in that project to make it happen. 
um, certainly over the recent years, there's been a real challenge where you've had people saying, we want to develop this project, it makes sense commercially, there's going to be a return, but we can't find any investors to invest in this project. And at the same time, at a global level, there's lots of people with lots of money which basically are saying we can't find any good projects to invest into to get a return, whether that's pension funds, insurance companies, and so on. So increasingly, there's been this whole move towards what, what's been termed responsible investment. How do you shift these very large uh, channels of money that flow into companies, that flow into projects, to channel them to flow into more green infrastructure, to clean energy infrastructure? Um, and so the, the, the notion of how do you finance renewables, energy efficiency, and things like that, that's the notion of green finance, which is financing uh, clean energy infrastructure, for example. Um, and what we're seeing is a very strong push amongst investors, pension funds in particular, insurance companies, to say we shouldn't be investing in, say, coal companies, because the future is not coal. We should be investing in things that give us a long-term return, like some of the renewable energy infrastructure. So we're starting to see that shift. And what uh, the Dublin group here that we're working with is trying to say, look, how do we ensure that the financial institutions that are located in Dublin are properly at the forefront of that change and shift so that it's very much more about investing into these long-term uh, environmentally beneficial, but also you still get a return, financially viable projects. And that's the, that's the notion of green finance. Of the Dublin group you've referred to, uh, so um, essentially they so it's Sustainable Nation Ireland yes. is the group that we're working with, but yeah. then also tying into some of the universities as well. Oh, right. But they're very engaged with um, different actors in the Irish financial yes. scene in Dublin yes. in particular, yes. Yes. Uh, and it's about engaging with those leadership yes. companies and yes. developing yes. new products and services. Basically, yeah. thank you very much. Um, table three, please. Thank you, Judge. I'm the facilitator at table three. Um, the citizens of this table had a couple of questions. The first two are for Andy. Uh, first question is, what type of subsidies did Scotland get and was there any EU subsidies? The second question is, is there any subsidies you would suggest or recommend for Ireland that we could use, um, including even if there was any schemes? Okay. Um so the subsidies that, that really came in at the beginning when I was talking in the early years, 2006, 7, 8, 9, were, were things called renewable obligation certificates, which, which was a, an obligation that the UK government put on energy companies to buy an increasing proportion of renewable power. And by forcing them to buy more power from renewable sources, essentially it incentivised people to start building more renewable infrastructure, more, more wind farms, more hydro and so on. So that was a subsidy which essentially got passed on to the consumer then. So the consumer then now pays about 10% of a, of, a, of a typical bill in the UK, or sorry, in, in Great Britain, will be essentially subsidies for energy efficiency or for uh, new renewables, uh, and increasingly for the nuclear power station that's being built um, in, in, uh, in Somerset. These subsidies basically were seen now to be too high because as over the last 10 years, renewable cost, the cost of generating energy from renewables, has essentially collapsed. It's much, much lower than it was before. So whereas there was a need to incentivize it 10 years ago, now I can put up a wind turbine in Scotland and it will be directly cost competitive with the market price. I don't need a subsidy to put it up. Um, and the same goes for solar panels. You know, we have had some subsidies which allow us to put solar panels on our roofs and sell into to, to the grid. You know, we, and those essentially have been cut back and cut back and cut back because we don't really need them anymore. So we're getting to the point where the, the, the subsidies are near zero and the issue is can you get access to the market? So in terms of, so your question about were they European subsidies? No, these are subsidies set at UK level. Yeah. Um, which is just within the UK, but it is aimed at delivering the EU renewable targets that the UK had signed up to. But it was very much just a UK subsidy scheme. In terms of going forward, because renewables are becoming so cheap, the issue is less about what subsidies do you need and more about how do you incentivize a system whereby if I want to put up a, 
a gas-fired power station. It costs a bit to put it up, but actually most of the cost is in actually buying gas to power it for the next 20 years. If you're doing energy efficiency or you're doing renewable energy, 90% of the cost, 95% of the cost is up front. And then it's virtually near zero cost running for the next 25 years. So trying to get from a, what you call an OPEX, an operating expenditure world, where most of the money comes through the course of the project, most of the, the costs come through the course of the project, to where most of the costs come right up front, where you need to find a lot of money to do it up front, that's the big challenge. And that's where you need the sort of financial infrastructure that big companies can provide in terms of smearing out the upfront costs so that it costs a little bit over a long period of time. Just sorry, there was just two general questions from the table as well, which I would think will need to be brought back to, uh, to the Irish government. Um, the first question was from some of the citizens at the table. Is there anything being done in schools to highlight this, or is there any TV marketing campaigns? And then the second question is, why isn't the Irish government going over to places like Scotland or Denmark to learn from what they have done already? All right. Well, I, I, I don't think it's fair to ask uh, Andy to re reply to those questions. How, how much? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I take another question. Table four. Yeah. Hi, I'm the facilitator for table four. Um, I have a statement that the citizens have asked me to read out on their behalf. We need a long-term ambitious cross-party plan to tackle climate change to make Ireland a leading country in renewable technology. And they have one question. Um, what are the main lessons Ireland can learn from Scotland, uh, how Scotland has responded to climate change, and what are the best ways to kickstart the same in Ireland? Yes. <laughs> I think one of the key things is to um, understand that, as I flagged at the end of my presentation, this isn't about saving polar bears. It's not about climate change. Climate change is actually almost a byproduct of saying, how do we get to being uh, a, a country where we're delivering the energy services that our citizens need, warm homes, efficient transport systems, so you're delivering what we need to, to live a thriving life. Um, but in the context of delivering it with a clean energy or delivering it with a resilience against climate impacts. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is actually about setting that vision for 10, 15, 20 years hence and saying, what do we want our city to be like? What do we want our rural communities to be like in those, you know, in 10 or 15 years? And then what is the route by which we would get there? So one of the things in Scotland that we have done is we actually have annual targets. Now, you know, if we have a cold winter, we'll miss the target. If we have a warm winter, we'll probably hit it. But it's more about getting that trajectory and forcing that conversation to be part of the political debate all of the time. So it's about saying, what can we do as a country that sets this target 10 or 15 years out? Um, and then that's the thing we need to focus on, is where, where do we want to be in 2030? Where do we want to be in 2035? Because that then sets things like planning. It sets what our, what our plans are on house building. It sets our intentions on transport infrastructure. So it, it's at that sort of scale that you need to be thinking, how do we get a clear shared vision for what we want our country to be like in 10 or 15, 20 years' time? Mm -hmm. And that's at the heart of it, is that long-term vision, which to me, politicians need, you know, that's what we've had in Scotland, is people prepared to say that's where we want to be. Now, reality always intrudes, you'll get knocked off course and that's fine. Um, things will change, like renewable energy costs have changed, which are making it much easier. But as long as you've got that clarity about what do we want to be as a country, that's the first starting point, um, and everything else kind of follows from that. Mm -hmm. Then you can think about how do we create the, the structures, the, the, like the cross-government structures, the structures between business and government, between local authority and national government, which allows these things to, to the enabling infrastructure to happen. So it's starting with a vision and then working through all of these different structures at local level, national level, between public sector, private sector, between communities, and so on. Uh, and that's the, that, to me, is the way you would start it. <coughs> Do you have policy distinctions in Scotland between um, mitigation and adaptation? We do. Like most countries, adaptation yeah. has been the, the poor cousin. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But in practice, there's actually quite a lot of things happening on the adaptation side. Yes. 
because we've had a whole series, we had a series of quite major floods, yes. flood events. Yeah. So what that forced was at a local level, at a local authority level, far more joined up efforts, not just to try and recover from the event itself, yeah, yes. but to say, if people have been affected by uh, flooding, for example, mm -hmm. then actually we need a lot longer term work, not just to talk about building flood defenses, but thinking about how we reshape mm -hmm. the way in which, where we put houses, what we do, how we design houses, yeah. how we work with people to recover from that. So it's much yes. more about longer term resilience. Yes, yeah. So one of the things that, one of the examples we have, there's a big storm went through <coughs> southern Scotland a few years ago. And what was really interesting was that exactly the same storm hit one of the islands, Arran, and it hit East Ayrshire. Yeah. Arran got back on its feet really quickly. Yeah, it, it, people went round, checked on people, you know, all the power was lost and it was a pretty dire storm. But actually they turned it round and, and got back on their feet very, very quickly. There was one or two communities in, in Ayrshire that didn't. It took ages to get back on their feet. They needed a huge amount of public money and support. And so one of the questions was, why was there such a difference in, for the, exactly the same storm, why was there such a difference? And it came down to what we would call social capital. It came down to resilience within communities, the, the extent to which you had engagement within communities about how they supported each other. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work now is sort of thinking about not just can you do an immediate response, mm -hmm. but how do you build the longer term structures which supports communities mm -hmm. to respond to these types of events. And actually what you find is those communities are also the ones that tend to then take forward energy projects or they take forward, you know, yeah. they're the ones that have a collective view about what they're trying to do. Mm. Uh, and that, that, that type of effort, there's a lot of work mm. trying to tie the two together. Um, at, at, at table four, table nine, table nine, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Judge. Um, the, yeah. I'm the facilitator for table number nine. And citizens had a couple of questions. Um, in respect to wind farms, um, they were very much pleased to hear that the communities are asked first, uh, but they were curious what happens uh, regarding planning challenges. How frequent are the planning challenges, and what methods do the government use to get over these planning challenges? Uh, they're also curious regarding wind farms. What are the employment benefits nationally regarding wind farms? Um, on a shorter question, what are the level of grants available to Scottish homeowners regarding insulating their houses or refitting their houses? Uh, and the final question was, uh, the citizens at the table, they feel that climate change is a very all-encompassing and quite intimidating word, and they were quite taken by your phrase that uh, it's not about saving polar bears, it's about heating your house more efficiently. And they wanted to know, did the Scottish government, when campaigning to the public about climate change, did they deliberately choose to focus on the local benefit for the individual rather than commenting on the global aspect of it? And I think that has to be the last question because there's an awful lot of material in it and, and, and it, it is all very, very relevant to, to what we're considering. Okay, so on, on wind farms, I mean, one of the key things that the Scottish Government did was to try and distinguish itself from what was happening in England and Wales because we could see subsidies were available and what Scotland said is how do we ensure that more of those investments into wind farms comes to Scotland rather than elsewhere. Now we have a benefit in, in some ways because we're windier and wetter than other parts of the UK. Um, but in terms of planning, what the government did was essentially put a presumption on planning that it would allow wind farms unless there was a particular reason why it shouldn't rather than the presumption 10, 15 years ago, which was the presumption that you shouldn't allow it unless there's a good reason why you should. And actually that made a slight difference. The bigger impact was that there is always challenges on wind farms, and this is part of the natural democratic process, and the, the national government didn't try and stop that. What it did do, though, was to um, encourage businesses that were investing in wind farms to approach and engage the communities that might be affected far more effectively than had been done in the past. And there is good evidence, and we've, we, you know, we, we've done a lot of work with the planning team in the Scottish Government showing that actually where there is good engagement by companies with the local communities, that actually it's both quicker to get through planning, there are less challenges, uh, and it's, so overall it's a much better system if you engage with local communities. So in, in other words, the, the engagement 
and the, uh, how you work the benefits to support the local communities strongly drove whether, whether you could get the wind farm through the planning system or not. So where there have been ones that have been turned away, or turned down, generally there have been ones where companies have come in and tried to do it without bothering to engage with, with, um, local, companies, uh, with local communities. So th there's been a direct effort to try and do that engagement. In terms of the uh, eco and insulating, um, there, is a, there has been in the, in the UK um, an, an, in, an onus on supply companies essentially to insulate homes and a requirement on them to insulate an increasing number of homes through something called eco. Um, and that's what they've been doing. So that is a form of subsidy to allow um, insulation to happen in, in homes, which have been directed particularly at those uh, who are least able to pay for it themselves. The Scottish Government, in their, in their 10 year plan around their Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme, which is this <coughs> big national infrastructure priority they have set to try and increase the quality of all homes and buildings across the country, um, they are looking, they provide income or, or they provide funds to local authorities to support uh, insulation. So again, they are making some funds available but they are aware that they're going to have to lever in, they're going to have to bring in private investment to help deliver the, the sort of 10 billion cost of that over the next few years. And the question then is what is the model by which you do that? So one way of doing that is to say, every time you sell a house, you're gonna be forced to actually upgrade the energy efficiency of the house. You know, that's an example. I'm not saying that's what will happen, but that's an example where you're forcing people <coughs> at the point where they've moved out of a house that you actually have to upgrade the efficiency of the home so that over a period of time you basically bump up the efficiency of the home to a much higher standard. So they're actually looking and talking with lots of people about what are the best ways of ramping up this efficiency um, because it, people generally won't do it themselves. They need some incentive, either regulatory or financial, to do it. Uh, and that's, that's really where we are with that. Um, in terms of... Uh, Local benefit, and I've lost my, <coughs> what was the third question? It was just in respect to, um, did the Scottish government deliberately choose to focus on local benefit yes, rather sorry. than scaring yeah. off the public by using yeah. terms like global the, change? The, the, the Scottish government has tried lots of different things. Some have been uh, marketing campaigns talking about climate change at a very global level. Other things have focused on a very local level. There's a, there's a regular uh, attitude survey, a very comprehensive attitude survey, which kept on picking out that people did care about climate change, but often didn't do very much about it. But they also cared about, you know, dog fouling pavement. So it tended to be very local or very global. Um, and so a lot of the focus in terms of the action plan that the Scottish Government has put into place is focused on the local benefit. Um, but they still talk about how we Scotland likes being at the forefront of, of things, you know, it, it's, it's, we've only been devolved for 20 years, so we've only had a parliament for 20 years. So in that sense, the sense of saying, actually, we can take a leadership position does, is, is very appealing to people. So flagging that we have an lead, international leadership position is useful and important, and the government does it. But they also do focus on what is the local benefit of doing this. And that, to me, is the, the heart of the, how you bring people on board, because that's where people can engage. You know? uh, it's not on the, the big and global so easily. There's, there's a group of 10% you know, of the population who care passionately and will do something, 90% won't. So actually the way in which you engage the 90% is to focus on things that matter to them. Well, we've learned so much in the last 35 minutes that I wish we had another hour. Unfortunately, we don't. I'm really grateful to Andy and just you demonstrate your gratitude as well. <laughs>